Welcome back, everyone, to the Hearthstone Grand Masters week number six, day two broadcast. Today is May 23rd, 2020. On this day in history, uh, not too long ago, a few years ago, we had the great John Nash, who uh, won a Nobel Peace Prize, or rather Nobel Prize in Economics for his landmark work on game theory uh, and the passing away. Legendary guy made a film based off his life called A Beautiful Mind. And thus, game theory has uh, since then permeated many minds, uh, of course, both from a economic study as well as people who just are nerds that love video games. And so, TJ, we enter a different discussion of a different kind of game theory, which is uh, what should be the bands heading into this series? As we have Warrior Band away from Buddyface, but Eddie, once more, leaving up the Warrior because he's brought that priest and he feels like he has a better chance against that. Um, so Buddyface, his demon hunter got banned. And we're left with Warrior Druid and Rogue. And this is a pretty unusual combination that you see left open, but does it make sense to you? Uh, I, it makes sense. I understand the theory behind it, but I don't know if I agree if it works in practice. Eddie is theoretically making a few of his matchups better. Um, I think the, you could say that those matchups are uh, Hunter, uh, because Hunter, a lot of players, even though our stats didn't say that, a lot of players think that the uh, Hunter does better against Warrior than it does against Demon Hunter. There also, I've been hearing some rumblings that Druid is supposed to be favored against Warrior. And I, I don't get it. I, I don't understand it. I feel like Risky Skipper just blows you out of the game, but the package that uh, these players are running with uh, Double Exotic Mount Seller and Ysera Unleashed, um, those cards, if you can get the early ramp, you are given time with Warrior most of the time. If you can survive the early game, just putting essentially like one Iron Bark big threat in the way is enough to just win you the game uh, single-handedly. So I have played a bunch of the matchup, and it seems good. But Eddie's just probably just trying to make his matchups better and also thinks that his priest is more favored against Warrior than it is against Demon Hunter as well. So um, he's just trying to make his worst matchups better instead of making his uh, his good matchups even better. And uh, there's still a lot of players that argue both sides of almost every matchup that we're going to see from Eddie and Bloody Face this series, which makes it interesting, honestly. It does make it interesting, and we'll see how it ends up shaping up for these players here as Bloodyface uh, queuing up the Spell Druid, a deck that's had some high highs at the beginning of Grandmasters this season, and recently has kind of gone through a valley of sorts, not really uh, being consistent for a lot of the players. Um, however, the deck lists are, do are varying from player to player, and they are just evolving in terms of ideology. So, for example, Kale Thaw Sunstrider, not really making it into a lot of decks right now because it felt like it just didn't really uh, fit the deck enough. Um, it was a little bit too greedy on the combo-oriented route. But Bloodyface chose choosing to keep it, you know? Like, some players are choosing to exclude that Kael'thas, which was shocking to me. And yesterday, there were several spots where it was like, yeah, I kind of wish this hand had Kael'thas because there's a bunch of cheap spells that did small things, but nothing really tied it together. So, you know, Bloodyface has one of the most important cards to start things off, Fungal Fortunes. And Eddie, as the as the, the Priest, is not going to be able to put on a lot of pressure. And I think that introduces a couple of difficulties for the Priest. Um, I feel like Priest has tools to deal with the Druid, TJ. But the problem is Druid, if, if they are in tune with what they need to do, will make it difficult for Priest to get the ideal clear and if they ever have that savage drawer in hand to just end the game, uh, priest could just die at any moment. So it's very scary to play as a priest player. In my opinion. Yeah, and uh, in testing throughout the week, um, Druid did come out on top as far as uh, you know who's supposedly favored in the matchup. Which is funny to think about because priest was considered one of the favorites against Druid early on in the meta game, but that was when they were running. Uh, Breath of the Infinite, Holy Nova, and Plague of Death. 
now they only run Breath of the Infinite and Soul Mirror as removal, and oftentimes those aren't enough, especially with the Ysera Unleashed double Mount Cellar version that players are running. Uh, it makes it very difficult to deal with all the waves of threats because there is going to be a lot. Um, and the, the biggest thing, I think, about this matchup for the Priest is actually building a board in the early game. You can't just hope you can react to whatever the Druid does. You have to build a board so that once you clear, you have things to capitalize on and put the Druid under some type of pressure so they can't just do whatever they want and build whatever board they want. They actually have to go off. Um, so uh, I definitely like it. Also, the getting the double invoke uh, is incredibly important uh, for Fate Weaver because it just allows you to do more in a turn and get ahead in tempo because that's what the Druid wants. They want time. And the less time you give them, uh, the happier they will be. So... Well, I wonder what he sees. Yeah, well, I mean, this kind of curve is still pretty reasonable. Uh, do we have a spectator bug? Because everything is highlighted, including illegal plays that are 0 to 3. So uh, we might need a little update there. Yep. Uh, I, I think there's been some spectate issues throughout the day today. Consider. That's okay, TJ. Uh, across all, all we the are reasons. yeah. Our, our observer PCs are practicing social distancing. Apparently. <laughs> well, it's not just our PCs. It happens even when uh, uh, like okay, a okay. spectate uh, friendly matches. Yes. Ooh. Eddie, you know Eddie has been kind of ironclad in a lot of his reactions in the pr in the past, but it seems like particularly some of the the uh, plays that he sees coming out of his opponent in the past few matches it just seems to land a little bit harder you know Blightface landing that overgrowth on yeah. curve from the top of his deck but look yeah because <laughs> it's perfect timing right because yeah. uh, otherwise if he had waited a turn to play Matt or, or if it was in his hand before he could have played it from Madame Lazul so like the not even that it was in the hand it was just that it was off the top and he didn't even have a chance to get it from Madame Lazul <laughs> I mean it's tilting right Yes, but uh, he is going to go ahead and um, uh, keep building up a board, and he's he's got answers for a few things. Uh, you know, the the biggest thing that he's hoping doesn't come out right now is like exotic mount seller plus a bunch of stuff, but he even has like shadow madness, shadow or death uh, to pick that apart. So he's going to try and keep building up boards every turn and keep answering what bloody face is doing, and eventually he'll hit critical mass, and that's the theory, right? Yes. And so, Bloody Face, when he gets to this Ysera point, ideally, you know, is in a pretty healthy state, and it looks like he is going to be able to safely drop it at the moment with that second ramp form. <laughs> Time rip your grandmummy here to get the discount on Fate Weaver. It also has the benefit of uh, getting the evoke out of the way for Galakrom. Like, it mana does. does become an issue, right? Because you, you have to deal with uh, everything they're, they're going for. It's true, but what's the point of Fate Weaver discount, if you, like, kind of think about it? If you're going to float five mana, but then discount five cards by one, it feels kind of moot, right? Like, you're, you're just basically giving up that ability to establish that 3-6 on the board. And with cards yeah. like Ap Apotheosis, it feels, like, important to establish the board. Oh, my. The Mind That's Flayer. That's quite good. Yeah, I mean, a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three, that who's yeah. Death all summons a 4-12. Yeah. Sounds great. But you do want to time rip this too, right? Yeah, I think uh, you got to time rip it. And I mean, uh, this upside. Yeah. In this deck specifically, when Bloodyface is playing like Kale Thos, there's a lot of upside to holding on to Mind Flayer. Yeah, even Exotic Mount Cellar, right? Uh, because uh, you generally have a, a turn where you're going to be dumping cheap removal. Because you're not going to have big... Whoa! Oh, jeez. You're not going to have big what? <laughs> you're, you're not going to have infinite like AoE removal spells. Like Soul Mirrors and Breath of the Infinites. There's going to be turns where you just need to kind of pick things apart. And this is one of them. And this is also one of the problems with like an early Ysera Unleashed. Um, is that it's much easier for priests to manage when it comes like one at a time or two at a time, because they can use spot removal, they can shadow or death and time rip, and and develop in the same turn, and then move on. Uh, so while early Sarah unleash is good, it's a big minion on board. You get the portals. You not knowing when they're going to come out 
makes it so that you don't want to go big with Glowflies or exotic mount sellers because you you know you could end up wasting two portals, and it also is much more manageable uh, for a priest to deal with. You usually want to have like just uh, a sequence of really big turns, like one a, a big mount seller or a big Glowfly swarm, then a big mount seller, then a big mount seller, and then you drop your Sarah and have a bunch of portals come out at once. Because you have to put Priest to the test turn after turn, you can't let them kind of segment their removal out and, uh, you know, just be able to pick off one thing at a time. But Bloody Face's hand really didn't, couldn't do anything else, right? It's not like a um, ragging on his choice to do that because he didn't have a choice. He didn't have Goldfly Swarm or Mount Cellar at the time. He had to ramp into Ysera and then hope that, you know, he gets a big burst of Dream Portals to force out the big removal. But, right. you know, right now, hey, he's, he, things are just getting picked apart, and now it's going to be a 12-12 on the other side of the board. And he's starting to run out of time very quickly. Right. He has some great tools. Just needs a little bit more time. It's, it's interesting, right? The Priest abdoing down the Druid just through, like, a traditional mid-range approach. But it hasn't even done anything particularly impressive. It's played a three-attack minion. Yeah. And hit face for a few turns now. And that's kind of what we're talking about. That Fate Weaver could combo with stuff, but sometimes getting board presence is more important. Yep, Iron Bar just to get, get some taunts. Oh, Emperor Cobra. Actually, good for Eddie because <laughs> he has the Shadow Madness. Oh, in you're right. Shadow Madness. Is so annoying. Yeah. And I mean, this is a big board. Yeah. And th this is kind of what you need to do is present the big board and um, well, kind of go and burst like all at once instead of trying to do little, little mm -hmm. bitty things at a time. This is such a complex board state. Uh, the first thing I'm looking for is there any possible way for Eddie to lethal here? I don't. I think so. Um, I must consider. Um, no, like he no. can't push through these two taunts. He only has seven damage, and if you shadow madness something, it wouldn't work. So uh, it's probably least... shadow madness, death, breath of the infinite. Clear up as much stuff as you can. It does look correct to me. The upside is that your board state will look stronger because you do have that mind flare trading in. Yeah. He also probably needs to trade the Grand Mummy preemptively and then allows him to trade over one more minion. So he did decrease okay. the power significantly, and I don't believe Savage War is lethal. It'd be close. Well, actually, it would be, because the hero power makes it 23. Uh, yeah, because there would be 14 power with the King Moogle and the two Treants. Everybody gets plus two attack, so it's plus eight, and uh, hero power would be uh, plus seven. So that'd be very, very close to it. Uh, oh, because of the power of the wild as well. So, um, bloody face. What is he going to do? Is he just going to ignore this death thing, or do you do you just go for it? <sighs> Putting him on four damage. I mean, I guess you're you're most likely overflowing this turn. That's why he's making this right. value trade with the Mukla. Right. So you're not going to get killed. Well, you could bog beam and trade everything to Deathwing and then overflow, but that's that feels a little wasteful. Yeah, uh, the one thing he's got going for him is that he still has four portals left. Right. Um, oh, wow. Maybe three portals left, so he could reasonably go for these trades and then op overflow next turn and try and get portals. I do like this. I do like this because it preserves his board, and overflow is used similar to what we've seen a lot of Demon Hunter do with Skull of Gul'dan. Okay, so that shield of Galakron. Pretty reasonable pickup, but Eddie might be thinking about, you know, what's the value of 
playing Soul Mirror here just to clear the board and guarantee that he doesn't have to deal with this. Well, this fully invokes Galakron, which he knows that Overflow is likely, and he knows that there's portals left. Mm -hmm. So getting the mana out of the way seems pretty crucial if he wants to get fully invoked. <laughs> sure, so you get your mana back. It's a free 1-1. One -one. It's like patches, TJ. Pays for itself. You want to guess what it's going to be? Quickly. I wonder. Penance? Oh, Holy Ripple, okay. Okay, jeez. That reduces power on board by a good amount. Just in time. Oh! Not Stormo! Okay, no, no, another no Stormo, he's got to go! Seen. We've seen a couple of those door moves over the course of Grandmasters the past week or two. Yeah, the Dream Portals are, are take so long that by the time you, you see what you get from the Dream Portals, it your turns, turns over. Already over, yeah. But, I mean, these are almost all the Dream Portals remaining in the deck here. Yeah. I think that is the last one. There might be one more. Blight Face can't even, like, react to it in time. Yeah, and Galakrond will kill off most of these. Galakrond destroys four minions, very likely to kill off uh, some of these big dragons. And kills off the highest attack ones outside of Caligos. Caligos giving a free spell, though. I mean, who needs Kael'thas, right? You have a free spell guaranteed at the beginning. But, yeah, that's I mean, interesting. The thing is, Bloody Face is like out of threats out, outside of the Glowfly Swarm stuff, so if Eddie can keep it in check, that's it. Yeah. What if? Mm. And he has no follow up to these Glowfly Swarms. And Overgrowth is a dead card, Overflow is a dead card. He can hope to get Zixir from the exotic mount seller. Alright, he's going for just tempo plays onto the board. Last card is that Savage Roar. So he can start off with a free spell. But honestly, unless he's playing Glowfly Swarm and filling up his board for, with Exotic Mount Cellar, he can't really capitalize on this free spell very much. He can I cast Overgrowth and then just not cast the excess mana. Uh, that works. But if he Glowfly Swarms here, he summons six Glowflies and the value of the uh, Exotic Mount Cellar is completely wasted. Also, by dumping spells with Exotic Mount Cellar, he has less fodder for Glowfly Swarm. So I'm not even sure. Uh, maybe you just go for Glowfly Swarm there, and if Eddie like soul mirrors or does something to clean up the board, then you follow that up with the Exotic Mount Seller for another wave. Time waits for no one. Yeah, this is still really intimidating, and as long as there's the threat of savage roar eddie still has to respect a lot of it fate weaver that ain't it <laughs> although fate weaver does allow you to develop something else at the board which there is merit to think about uh, but it gives up a space. Yeah. Which well, means Soul Mirror I, I, doesn't clear as much. Yeah, precisely. And so, some of this gets cleared, but not all of it. Let's clear off the Mount Cellar, leaving six power on the board. Savage George gives another six. 
still pretty far, but Glowfly Swarm number two potentially coming out here. And if you're Bloody Face, this is this is everything. You gotta throw all that you got. Yeah. He has to clear some things off the board. You can part ways with the Moonfire. If he leaves uh, this power on board by itself, uh, after he kills the Dread Raven, so 11 plus 16 with the, uh, the, the swing from the Galakron weapon, he's not yeah. dead because he only takes the two fatigue next turn, so he can feel free to push face damage. Right. And by pushing face damage, he severely limits the amount of uh, Glowfly Storm said he needs to push the Savagor Rethel. So Eddie knows now that Savagor is really the only usable card that's left in hand. Oh. Shadow of Madness? 6, 10, 11, 16. He can copy his Grand Mummy. He can copy his uh, Mount Seller. Oh, no, you can't. Wait. Yeah, I think Shadowy Figure targets Death Rattle. Yeah. But I, I... For some reason, I thought that it had, like, a Soul of the Forest Death Rattle on it, but it's just the Lightning Bolt from the, uh... Indicating that it has some type of special right. effect. He just needs to clear as much stuff off here as possible. Right. And he can clear... Three more things? Which would leave two things... Which would be four plus seven. So eleven. Oh, Bloodyface just had a little bit more damage. Ah, but he's taking two. It, it's still not enough. It's four plus seven. It's eleven. He has no cards left. Wow, did Bloody Face at any juncture of this game have an opportunity to push just a little bit more damage? Nope. This was a tight one. Ha! <laughs> Dead card. Yeah. 14 damage showing. Got to yeah. trade two of it. Just got to play a minion. And you got this, right? Because he, he takes does, fatigue damage over to. two turns. Yeah, doesn't even have to. It's true. All he has to do is trade, 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 hit base with the rest of his minions, and then he's got two turn lethal set up. That's going to do it. Bloody Face just misses by one damage. This is as close as it gets in the game of Hearthstone. Was he hoping that there's a bomb randomly shuffled into his deck? Curse of Rafam is drawn. Yeah. So, well, don't let anyone ever convince you that one damage doesn't matter. I mean, this is as narrow of margins as you can ask for on both ends. Like, Eddie was off by a couple of points a yeah. couple turns ago. So, you know, had he pushed damage, maybe, and he lost by one damage, uh, it could have been, like, equally painful, but the opposite direction. So, uh, a real barn burner to start things off here. As Priest gets the win. That's not often that you see Priest lead off and get the W. It seems like Priest has um, been a very feast or famine type strategy. Like, either you get that win very easily because it crushed a specific deck you're looking for. In the past, it was like Priest was like sometimes dunking on Zoo Warlock. Yeah. Um, and then, then Priest would like just lose three games in a row on the other end. Uh, today, it looked like Priest was struggling, even just in the last series heading from Europe with Hunter Ace, not able to really get those Priest wins um, and just kind of get closed out, despite having matchups like the Priest Mirror, which could have gone either way, and Priest vs. Warrior uh, did not work out for him. Although it did take a kind of an extraordinary series of events again.
or uh, Hunter is to lose that Priest versus Warrior. Yeah, that I was saw the uh, Yasir. I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> that was um, if that last lackey from Live Wire Lance is anything else, Hunter is wins that game. But you know, you take Must those if you're money hopper. Um, but yeah, a close one. And uh, you know, if Eddie had drawn almost any other card in his deck outside of Shadow Madness, he might die that turn. That's kind of crazy. Just kind of ran off the top. Did have another Breath of the Infinite, I think. Apotheosis may have been able to heal him out since he had a big minion attacking. Um, but he did need some help, even at the end there, with Bloody Face being that close. So you can tell just how close that matchup is and how difficult it can be for Priest to deal with that many waves of threats over and over and over. And now we got a Druid Mirror match. And some slight differences in the deck lists. Uh, the notable one is that Bloody Face has Kael'thas, whereas Eddie does not. Um, Bloody Face also has the Starfall, which is a huge help in this matchup in particular. <laughs> this is great. I think I think Arsa should be played this fast always. <laughs> what is happening? I think the collective turns. Have, been, have oh amounted to less than 10 seconds, TJ. I think both players have spent <laughs> less than 10 seconds total for their turns. So. They've probably played so much of this matchup that they that they just know. <laughs> uh, but this is why... Eddie doesn't play Kael'thas. This is why you play Kael'thas, because you can do turns like this. Still not out of the woods yet, though, because now Eddie gets to at least try to capitalize on uh, having... A turn of development, but it doesn't really end up being a turn of development. He could try and stick an exotic mount seller. Uh, Bloodyface's deck really doesn't have a, a great way to deal with just an eight health minion on board. So even just bog beam here and trade in two of the minions to Kel'thas, that's difficult for Bloodyface to handle. He doesn't even currently have a way to deal with it in his hand. We'll have to rip something from Fungal Fortunes, but with both bog beams gone. And yep, he does have a way to deal with it. He has to Starfall, Savage Roar, Moonfire. And honestly, I think you just do it. If this exotic monster lives on the board, I don't care how many spells you drew, you're probably going to die. Yeah, I mean, things looked pretty good for Bloodyface with that overflow, and then just kind of hit nothing. So now we actually do have to sit, slow down and like think that this is not really the autopilot moment of the, the game. I close my swarm. He did not find Bog Beam. I think that was the one thing he was looking for. He used both of his Bog Beams on the kill Ah, team. you're right, you're right. Hmm. Oof! Woo. Huge. Absolutely huge. Let's take a look at other options besides uh, what we were kind of talking about. Is there anything Eddie could consider here? Uh, I mean, he could always consider Overflow. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of cheap spells in this deck that he could potentially capitalize. He also gets a free trade. Free yeah. as in he doesn't take the health damage on the Mount Cellar. He can go into that taunted Glowfly Swarm. Yeah. That's reasonable. And it's making me like it the more I look at it. Yeah. If he picks up Innervade, he can power the wild and get some double trades. Crystal power great as well. Yeah. Iron Bark, fin well, Moonfire. They're all good. Oh, oh, he's just getting good beasts. Oh my oh, goodness. Eh, Weaponized Wasp, I mean, it's better than Iron Beak Gall or Desert Hair. I'll yeah, take it. yeah, yeah. That's, that's the hour. You you expect a three mana three three because the mouse seller could only summon three cost beasts. Well, this is bad news. Okay, so a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Yeah. We're definitely 
on the struggle bus though here for bloody face how does yeah. he get past this i wonder if he was supposed to kill the outsider last turn <sighs> i i mean in hindsight it's a lot easier to say having seen two five fives two king muklas summon from that yeah but you expect that right you're passing eight mana wor worth of stuff over to your opponent with an exotic mounts on board chances are they're going to be able to do a lot um, now he's thinking it was probably yes he may be able to summon a lot of beasts but how many of my glow flies can he remove and if enough of them stick then I can you know capitalize with soul of the forest or maybe clean up with, with starfall after that but time waits for no one I can see. Yeah, Bodyface just gonna tap out. Eddie able to blow out that victory with that Mount Seller stick, and now that's gonna be a 2 0 lead for Eddie. You know, and, you know, Bodyface seemed like it's his week right now, but I would never call, I would never count out Bodyface. Uh, he's kind of been one to always have his back against the wall and sometimes just really put up when it really matters the most. Uh, against Highlander Hunter too. Highlander Hunter is not infallible. I mean, we saw yesterday that Highlander Hunter got swept from Papa Jason. Yeah. Um, you know, you could argue part of it could be plays. You could argue some of his deck list, but uh, at its core, Highlander Hunter still had. I mean, most people are playing at least twenty five of the good cards, right? You could maybe argue five cards at most, most of most hundred list, but they at least still have that core shell of uh, Dynasty Red Brand and. Zephyrus and all these really powerful cards. So let's see what Bladeface can do. Hunter has shown a lot of weakness. Um, it's also shown a lot of strength. And it kind of really depends what version of Rexar wants to show up today. The one that uh, it can really overwhelm people or the one that kind of has awkward draws. It's going to be the big question. Eleanor Hunter has been historically performing really well, but as you mentioned, it just Feels like it's been losing a lot over the past uh, week or so. Or notably, you know, yesterday. Felt like it was just losing a ton. Um, the hardest part about it is its ability to regain a board that it's lost. It doesn't off often have to switch to that game plan uh, as quickly as, you know, say, Face Hunter or Dragon Hunter, the more aggressive variants. Because it does have tools like Baranus, um with Desert Spear Unleashed the Hounds and Rot Nest Drake. Siamat. It can react to certain things, but if you go wide on board with a bunch of little stuff, or, you know, if you stick a War Maw Challenger on the board and enrage it and Blood Sword Mercenary it, that's kind of where the, the difficulty lies when playing against Warrior. Uh, but because, you know, the deck usually gives you time, their early game is all about setting up. Uh, they don't usually get onto the board and uh, in a meaningful way until turn four or five, when they can start unlocking some of their more powerful combos. That lets you develop your own curve and develop your own game plan. And uh, that's why we're seeing some of these players with uh, Highlander Hunter and Priest mm -hmm. in the same lineup, um, or Highlander Hunter plus other slow deck that's vulnerable to aggression, Band Demon Hunter instead of Warrior, because they just want a little bit more time and they're willing to accept uh, the combo potential and the overall power level of Warrior to uh, make some of those matchups slightly better. I mean, that is something that sounds right, and we've seen it even play out in practice. Um, and sometimes it still doesn't even, ha it still doesn't, it's still not enough, though, to win the matchup. So we shall see how Bloody Face chooses to respond to Eddie's kind of like really slow pace here. Think about Highlander Hunters that it just seems like a lot of their lines of play are just kind of committing to play one card a turn while Warrior sets up their lines of play to play six or seven cards a turn. Um, obviously that's, you know, exaggerating. It's not the case. Warrior doesn't always play, you know, that many cards every turn, but it's their goal. Their goal is to just go for these huge combos and try to turn around the game that way. 
And, you know, when I look at what's happening here, Bloody Face still doesn't have that much of an incentive to extend much onto the board, especially if Eddie's not presenting a lot of threat. And it seems like putting them to the test and actually developing threats is how you can get ahead of this matchup. Because it feels like in the light game, because of the thing you mentioned, where you're just playing one power card a turn, and the warrior's doing a bunch of stuff and going wide, you're going to need to get bailed out by Zephyrus or Dragon Queen Alexstrasza in many situations if you try and play uh, uh, slowly. Because then the warrior can just match your pace. And that's not what you want. This is really awkward for Eddie. No dragon in hand, so can't take a 50-50 for Rotnest Drake. This Bomb Wrangler will summon uh, multiple bombs. Ditch by Eddie's face, he doesn't like his tracking options here, which either means he hit three poor options or multiple good options and doesn't want to discard one. But looks like it is four options because... Fairy Dragon came out the other end of it. Ooh! Ooh, four damage to the face. Your bloody face, you'd love to see it. I really didn't think fantastic to do here. Yeah, this is this is tough. Um, it's tough in the sense that you, there's no real clear direction. Why face looks like he's just trying to flood the board? Yeah, through tempo. Like it's not necessarily like the most impressive amount of stats, and but. It's gonna wide. Get up. Yeah. A lot of it's going to get cleaned up. You can attack into uh, the Lackey, mm -hmm. uh, use the uh, Faces Corruptor to trade over both Armor Smiths. Right. He's got the two four one, four ones on board versus uh, just a Bloodsworn Mercenary and, a, and, a, bot, and a, a Boom Bot. Seems reasonable to me. This also shuts off the Battle Rage uh, possibilities that it looked like Bloody Face was setting up. And now a hand with double cork on elite, no battle rage, no risky skipper. He doesn't really have a way to accelerate, so this might just be a an all-out race <laughs> from this point on because Bloody Face has I mean, just with the weapon swing, damage on board he has six, damage in hand he has eight, nine, ten. If he can get something damaged, that's thirteen. That's real close. Another impactful lackey here could make all the difference as well. Uh, maybe even some boob bot damage to face, which he can guarantee by trading in this Blood Boil Brute first. He could also swing and pick up Witchy Lackey. Oh. <laughs> Just do that, like, four more times. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I mean, Bloody Face, just because he's able to get six extra damage versus the one damage of the Boom Bots, now very much within striking distance. He has two Corcon Elites and a Rampage. Ooh. Not swinging with the weapon. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, if he plays the Exidic Swamp Ooze, Eddie's plays are still kind of limited. Yeah, yeah true. Just trying to pick things apart. The uh, rotten strike seems really unreliable. And Bloody Face here, if he picks up a single source of damn self damage, is that just it? Six, eight, twelve, fifteen. 
Am I counting it right? So you have six on the board, yeah. eight through the inner rage, four through the Corcoran Elite, and three through the ramp. <laughs> He's just dead. Yep. He is dead. And Eddie's Highlander Hunter just gets blown up on turn seven because, I mean, I mean those boombots were disgusting. But what if he still had extra damage from the hand, right? So let, let's just like level here and say, let's say Eddie cleared the board, but wasn't able to play a taunt. He still had four more damage. So even if the boombots didn't high roll, just, the, the warrior just had too much pressure. Yeah, those those boombots hitting forward face was just uh, was tough. I, I I also Eddie just played things really slowly. He died with coin in hand. And he floated, he floated mana on multiple turns. Yeah. Not that like that makes a huge difference, but like getting something on the board instead of hero power passing on turn three, you know, maybe you develop Zixer instead, or equip uh, the the storm hammer, open up additional mana crystals. He corsair cash on two, so you expect a weapon. So why not put a four health minion in play, knowing that it's not going to die to any of the three attack weapons? I don't know. Just seemed a little uh, uh, slow. Um, like I said, if you if the warrior's playing a little bit slow and you just match their pace, they, they just do more powerful things than you uh, once they have enough time. So try and get on the board fast and force them to react instead of allowing them to play pride. Yeah, well, here we go into Rogue versus the Highlander Hunter. I actually do like the this version of Rogue against Hunters because it feels like because they play a leaner deck list than the Highlander one, that, it, that they can go at a pace a little bit quicker than the Highlanders like, okay, I play a threat, you play a threat, I play a threat. And like whoever has the Dragon Queen Alex Straza set up that's cleaner is in the late game advantage. Um, and then, you know, you kind of mix in different like power cards uh, like Galakron, for example, or for Hunter, it's um, some of their damage burst from hand. The Galakron Secret Rogue feels like it's just able to get a step quicker, so that way some of those higher impact cards from Hunter are a lot worse. Like Rottenest Drake is like a pretty important moment for that Highlander Hunter deck to start turning the corner and maybe pressuring their Um And there's so many lackeys, so many ways to kind of mess with the Hunter. Like you play, they play like a big threat and then you have Ambush coming. Um, it just feels like this is better equipped to deal with Hunter than uh, a lot of other decks. Yeah, it feels like the only real strategy that works is play big things that are difficult for Rogue to deal with, like Fairy Dragon, Imprisoned Felmaw, Evasive Fey Wing, things that they can't interact with with standard tempo plays. Let the hunt begin. And then just keep hitting them. Like that. <laughs> that seems to be the most effective strategy. Because as soon as you're trying to play, like you mentioned, like an honest game where you're trying to go threat for threat, they have so much more value. You never want to sink damage into a lackey. But those lackeys add up. Very much so. So, I don't know. It's uh, it, you On paper, it's like, well, Rogue goes really slow. They have no life gain. How do they right. deal with it? Um, well, they eventually just get so far ahead in tempo in the, in the mid game that Hunter just can't do anything. They're just hero powering and trying to race you, and then they're reliant on drawing only damage from their deck. So, it does feel like the matches that we've yeah. watched... Uh, Rogue just kind of, as long as, like I said, none of the crazy stuff comes out, things that they can't interact with and use backstab, seal fate, uh, lackeys for tempo on, um, they have a decent chance. Yeah, it seems like the data, when you take uh, it oh, from a big glance, that it seems Highlander Hunter favored, but with each rank that you increase and you, you start to slice the data differently through like the lens of only legend players and above, the matchup becomes pretty even, and it seems like it's 50-50 right now. And that, that that sounds right to me, because Highlander Hunter still has, you know, exactly what you're describing. Mm. Like, the pressure tools, Hunter can't, uh, or sorry, Rogue can't heal, as mentioned. So if Hunter gets off to a quick start, like this Imprisoned Felmaw, which looks nutty, the slow opening for Rogue, Yeah, uh, that's where Hunter gets the advantage. But, you know, with, the more experience you become with Rogue, the more you're able to... Just apply enough pressure and weave your way through the hunter traffic, uh, it becomes problematic for that hunter. Yeah, I will say that, and this is not a slight towards Highlander Hunter players, but it, it, it does have a lower skill ceiling than Rogue. Um, just wow. because shots fired. I mean, it's just true, right? Like the their play, their most of their plays are pretty one-dimensional. Um, 
And outside of, you know, like mulligans and uh, Hearthstone Fundamentals, which you can apply to any deck, um, it does have a lower skill ceiling than Rogue. And that's, I mean, that's, you can use the data to uh, explain that theory as well, right? The fact that the matchup gets a lot closer, the, the higher rank you go kind of indicates that as well. I'm not Hard saying it's an easy deck that, to play. DJ. I'm saying that yeah. Rogue just has way oh! more <laughs> Nailed it! That's a one in five. How does that happen every single time? Like Clockwork, I don't get it. I mean, that's actually I pretty big. That's just, that's just what happens. And he just nets five extra damage, puts a Bone Wraith in the way. This hand from Eddie is kind of exactly what you want in this situation. This is a hand where you don't really have to care about the board unless it reaches critical mass and just keep firing upstairs. Prison Felmall knew what Eddie's game plan needed to be and helped him out a little bit. Don't let the door hit you. Uh, Bamboozle picked up, which means... Right. See you later, Bone Wraith. And this is a question that Bloodface has to answer with, which is, do I trade into this Velma and make it easier for Eddie to deal with this? But he knows that Bone Wraith is playable the following turn. So if his opponent pushes face and plays Bone Wraith, he might be in a similar position as he is anyways, except this 5-4 Felma got a chance to hit him again. So based off that, with no ability to activate the um, High Spear and Togwoggle, there's no reason to keep these lackeys around. I'm in favor of trading. It looks like Bloody Face agrees. And if I'm Eddie, I'm you know looking at the Scavenger's Ingenuity right now, thinking about you know, what's the likelihood that this ends up paying off. I guess the problem is the Faceless Corruptor in the deck. And if you draw a Faceless Corruptor, you kind of basically don't have anything to do this turn. Yeah. Well, saying if he hits Diving Griffin and then picks Sorry, it. yes, correct. Uh, he hits Diving Griffin and then the Faceless Corruptor. I was thinking a step ahead. Appreciate it. Good looking out, Deej. But if he does hit Diamond Griffin and then wants to trade into a minion, like, what does he do? Just kill a 1 1 and get rid of the Bamboozle? I mean, I am a huge advocate for getting rid of Bamboozle as soon as you have the availability <laughs> to. We've seen so many players punished for being like, nope, I'm, I'm smart. I'm a smart cookie. I'm not going to play into the Bamboozle. I'm not going to get Bamboozle today. And then they get into a situation like four or five turns down the line where they just can't make any attacks because the only things that they can attack into are going to give their opponent eight drops when they had opportunities to maybe sacrifice a tiny bit of tempo to get a, like a four drop instead. So, Diving Griffin. Face Stalker was drawn, so I believe Diving Griffin and Zixer were the only two possibilities. Yeah. And I don't even know if he was hoping for Zixer because uh, he wouldn't be able to clear the board as much this turn, but he True. would have had the 6-6 six, six, Zixer Prime in hand, which would have been... I mean, that's nutty. <laughs> you just say the same thing three times? 6-6 six, six, oh. Zixer? 6-6 six, six, Zixer? 6... A sick 6-6 six, six, Zixor. Played Bless by you. Sixo. Sick, six oh sick, six 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 soar. <laughs> I still can't believe we get paid to do this. Uh, <laughs> eye for an eye is the only playable secret this turn, but is there value in picking up cards like Vaporize? Vaporize could really mess. Okay, oh, yeah. there's pack tactics. Pack tactics. Pack tactics. I was thinking about Vaporize as like a idea for Diamond Hammer Brand because it's such a problematic card. <gasps> um, ooh, he's doing it! Raven's favorite play! Shadow Stepping Hanar. Oh, this is awkward. This would be a beautiful turn to 
play Dante or Brandon, smack your opponent for 10. But then your King Crush goes bye-bye if this is an ambush. I don't know. Ambush? Do you care? Like Ambush doesn't seem that problematic, to be honest. And now sees that it is not. So how do you deal with this as the rogue? You put a bunch of secrets in play, I guess. <laughs> and hope that it makes it awkward. Look, dig for misdirection, or I don't even know. Yeah. It's tough. I never lie. Secrets are good, but not, not that, that good, good TJ. Yeah. <laughs> they're good. I don't know if they're that oh. good. Though. Misdirection. Can you clear off everything after the misdirection? Yes, he can. So you mm -hmm. eviscerate, kill everything on the board, isolate the king crush. True. I mean, it might look like even just a freezing trap. There's a couple of th reasons for Eddie to not necessarily attack with that, but he could try to play around that through Siamat. I mean, this is just a lot of annoying things. There's no sacrifice. It's a possibility. But there's one card that can answer all of them, TJ. Yep. And that's our good buddy, Zephyrus the Great. If you play Zephyrus, you're offered the opportunity to get Flare. Yeah, he, he does have to manipulate it, though. Otherwise, it'll give you uh, things like the SI7 Infiltrator and a bunch of nonsense. I, I've not been offered Flare uh, in situations where I play it with full mana available. Right. Uh, so he's going to manipulate the mana first. Yeah, and Bloody Face knows. Flare destroys this entire setup here from Bloody Face. Oof! Bye-bye. Seven mana. Bye bye, buddy face. Looks like he's dead. Yeah. Good try. Only one of those secrets were counterspell. Beforehand, of course. Okay, no sacrifice. He's just going to try and make it as awkward as he possibly can <laughs> for Eddie. Exactly. But so you can remove it. There's no mage secret. So Eddie can just corrosive breath hero power. <laughs> God will care about the secrets. Right. And praise Galakron trade. Although he doesn't know what secret. Yeah. It, it, it really doesn't matter here. It looks like Bloody Face doesn't have that opening anymore. Hunter crushed its way through. Very much. And that'll do it. Funny enough, you can use corrosive breath also. Um, even if there's like Bloody Face had the optimal setup here, but I mean, there's not really too much to think about. Uh, Eddie's gonna win. Improved to a 3-2 and two record, a crucial victory here to improve his chances for playoffs. Bloody Face still very much in that danger uh, that uh, zone, excuse me, to make playoffs. Not really in danger of missing it, but, you know, not really the weekend he was looking for. Starting off 4-0, ending at 4-2. Yeah. That's a rough one. That's a rough one. But it is, as you mentioned, uh, he doesn't really have much to worry about here. Um, seeding. Could be a big thing. Also, just you know, bragging rights of being higher seed in the division um, is you know a big deal to a lot of players. But that I think that win was a lot bigger for Eddie because now he's starting to separate himself uh, from the, uh, the the bottom of the division. And because he's in Division A, three two record seems fantastic, right? He gets to go into the last week uh, with head held high, and even if he loses out three four, probably even good enough for playoffs if you're in Division A. So couple big wins uh, for Eddie over the past couple weeks that have put him at a winning record. Yeah, good stuff, honestly. Um, and that ends up putting Eddie in a pretty good position to make playoffs. He's able to get one or two more crucial victories. 
Uh, but in the meantime, that means we are already one out of two matches done for Division A today. And we're going to have a battle between Latin American representatives. We have Algodon and Empanizado. Um, and, you know, that's going to be coming up next. And then we have Purple Frozen and Zelay and PNC.